Hello everyone, this is Suzanne Knabenikol from Police Science Doctor, and this is the second in the series of conference summaries from the 2020 Society of Evidence-Based Policing conference that took place online. And the conference talk I've got for you today that I'm going to be summarizing for you is by Nick Morgan. He's a violent crime researcher at the Home Office in the UK. So he works in London and basically what he did, he completed a research project that is available on the Gov UK website. So if you go to www.gov.uk, you can actually look up his report there. And basically his talk was based on this report. It's about trends in drivers in homicide. And there were some interesting things that they uncovered there. So he starts out with the slides with some newspaper headlines just to show the extent of the variety of homicide that we can all experience or that we are aware of and there can be very different circumstances and motivations. Now about 30 percent of homicides are actually domestic so these are partners, ex-partners but this um, figure also includes infanticide. Then terrorism is actually only four percent. We always think that it's um, more than that. We, we think it's this much bigger thing because of the, everything that is covered in the media when something is happening. Corporate manslaughter, like for example, neglecting people in care homes is three percent. So really almost two thirds of murders and homicides are other categorized as other. And these are the main ones that we're going to be looking at today. So it's quite interesting that there are global trends. Now, I always wonder how this is all coordinated between all the offenders from different countries. It's obviously not, but it's, it's quite interesting to think about that. So this is the global trend around the world. It was sort of increasing and decreasing around the same time. So you pay, perhaps you can't see this very well, but this graph starts at around 1950 and goes up to 2010. Red is the overall trend. Okay, so we can see that there was quite a rise from the 1960s up until 1990, and then it was falling from the 90s overall. E plus W is England and Wales. In essence, this research project that Nick Morgan did was trying to unpick these trends and to see what's behind it. And they reviewed a lot of publications, but there is no single factor that actually influences this. So this is something that they found with all the research. There is no one thing that determines all this. So the current situation is that, um, so in 2017-18, about 70% of homicide victims were male, 90% of known suspects were male. Okay, so it's mainly male-on-male -male homicide that's going on. Most victims and suspects are white, and there's a strong relationship with the neighborhood deprivation levels, which is obviously not a surprise to most. Then here, England and Wales long-term homicide trend, Again, we had um, a drop from 1901 to 1950s, sharp rise from the 50s up until 2005, perhaps, 2001. Then there was a sharp drop, and then again there was a sharp rise. So obviously, you know, one does wonder what is going on there. So interestingly, when you split up that graph, the rise from the let's say 50s, 60s, is mainly caused by murders of males. Okay, so females, that's the red line. They were female victimization and male victimization when it comes to homicide was pretty much equal up to then. So if we break this down, until the late 70s, homicide was relatively equally split between both genders as victims. And homicides of males are responsible for the peaks that we've seen in the last decades. So that's something that perhaps we didn't know before. Until the mid 50s, all victims, um, all victim age groups had somewhat similar rates. So that's the graph on the left. When we're looking at, um, you can't see this very well, so just, just take my word for it. But obviously, this summary is for you to get an interest in the actual full session. Go to the SEBP website that I'm linking to in the text, and then you can have the full session. You get more detail. I'm just giving you a rough overview here. Um, so the dramatic rise since then is due to murders in over 15s and splitting out male victims aged 15 to 44. They actually account for the peak and drop since the 1970s. The red line on the right correlated with crime overall. So that's the one, the, the graph on the right. Um, so that's still a downward trend. So crime overall is still going down, 
but it's serious violence like gun crime, knife crime, and robbery that went up recently. And that's correlated with the blue line, and that's male victims between 50 and 15 and 44 years of age. So it's important to unpick all this data. It's not all just one pot, okay? We need to find out exactly what's going on. So the next slide, what it shows us is that when homicide rises sharply, it's, um, it tends to be that knives are involved. This is in England and Wales. This might look different in the US, of course. So what we've got here is that drug-related crimes formed a big part of the increase. More cases involve drug users rather than dealers. And the increases in, are driven by male-on-male -male cases involving knives and often linked to drugs. Okay, so this is something that we may have been hearing from, um, you know, gangs and county lines and everything as well. England and Wales has a low homicide rate compared to other countries and is quite average in Western Europe. So these are the um, homicide cases per 100,000 residents. Um, obviously, in, in this selection of countries, US has the highest rate. And when we look at this graph, international countries... Um, don't always follow the overall trend. So Japan actually had a drop. We'll get to Japan in a minute as well. And some Central and South American countries actually had a rise in, in murder. The US, England and Wales, Netherlands and Canada followed the long-term pattern of rise in the 1960s and fall from the late 90s. Here we see that around three and a half as many male victims are killed as female victims. And the short, sharp peaks are also caused by higher male victimizations in the US, just as was the case in England and Wales. So Nick Morgan and his team tried to find out what was going on there. You know, why this, um, why this rate, why this high increase in homicides since the 60s? And as I said earlier, there is no one single factor, but things that may have contributed um, in essence, it's difficult to explain the long-term wave. So that's, you know, we're looking at from 1901, these graphs were actually going. Um, it's difficult to identify criminal justice variables or economic variables because the, economic was actually re the econom economy was actually relatively good in the 60s. So that can't explain the, the change in homicide pattern. But there were higher birth rates and we've got the baby boomers. So a lot more people on the scene although that still is not the only reason. So when we look at the possible drivers, alcohol consumption correlates to homicide rates. So the solid line, solid black line is alcohol. The dotted black line is homicide. So there's a, there's a correlation, correlation there, but we don't know if it's a cause or a trigger. Research shows that alcohol increases violence in those that are already prone to aggression. And there was also a switch from Victorian restraint um, to more hedonistic lifestyles in the 60s, as we know. So self-control was not really seen as cool anymore, but perhaps did that change in the 1990s when you know AIDS and HIV came on the scene and the drug epidemic, so perhaps self-restraint came back into fashion. Maybe that's what then started the drop. Um, we also have much higher employment of females since the 60s and 70s, so high rates of people living alone. Then on this next slide, again, we're looking at possible drivers. So I think these are some of the most, uh, most plausible explanations. So factors linked to the generation that produced the generation that experienced or caused increased homicides in the 50s. We had huge rises in teenage pregnancies and we had huge rises in birth into already large births, into already large families. And these are two documented risk factors for crime and violence. Okay, so that is something that has been happening since the 50s that may have contributed to the sharp rise in violence and homicide. There was a rise and then a fall in child abuse based on when victims were born. So the long wave of homicide correlates with crime overall. And in the chart on the top right with the colored graphs, we see that people growing up in the 60s were more likely to experience sexual assault than those born after, and most form of abuse has become less common the later victims were born. So there, was in, there were increased birth rates, large families, lots of teenage pregnancies, and abuse was more rife back then and has been dropping since then. So there was a drop in teenage pregnancies from the 70s, an increase in women's and children's rights and the contraceptive pill came in. There were also change, changes to abortion and divorce legislation. Okay, so this may all have contributed to the drops that came in homicide and the drops in numbers of people. And what we find is basically 
Many spikes in homicide were actually caused by drugs, organized crime and gangs. In 1980, there was a drug war going on in Miami, in Florida, in the States, and which made it the murder capital of the world in that particular year. There were spikes in homicides in the US that were correlated with the crack cocaine epidemic there. Sorry, with the crack epidemic and deprived areas were more likely to have gangs. In England, in Wales, we saw a heroin epidemic that began in the late 70s and organized crime became dominated by drugs and young males started getting involved. Male-female victimization from the earlier slide st to, um, starts to split there. So once the organized crime was getting involved, drugs, that's when the overall homicide race, which was relatively equal between men, men and women dying, was then starting to split up. So crime, gangs, drugs, they are starting to cause the male-on-male -male figures that we've seen. So when we're looking at criminal justice factors, so the blue line on the left is the homicide rate and the red line is prison population. So this is England and Wales. We can see there was a sharp rise in incarcerations from the early 90s, the red line, but it took another decade for homicide to actually drop. So that was not accounting for the, you know, for the drop. It was not effective. However, more police tend to be correlated with fewer homicides. What can work, according to Nick, is um, focused deterrence. So you target high-risk offenders and groups and gangs, and you warn them that the police are watching, but you're also offering them support mechanisms to leave the life crime behind. Um, you keep an eye on them, and you make sure you make sure they know that certain acts are not going to be tolerated, so they know they're being watched. Um, also engage them, engage them with the community. Another thing that seems to have helped is the street crime initiative, which started in the early 2000s. In some police forces, they allocated additional resources to reduce robbery. Now, robbery actually correlates to homicide in that homo many homicide offenders have robbery in their history. So if you have initiatives that target reducing robbery, that may actually also indirectly um, reduce homicides. So... In terms of conclusions, so something that I found quite interesting in low homicide societies and you know, also looking at the long wave, those who do kill are often marginalized people with mental health issues and a number of other risk factors and vulnerabilities, and they kill victims of all demographics. Now, when it comes to high homicide phases or countries, we see a bit more of a different pattern. So the homicides are more goal-driven. They're embedded in economy, economies of violence, protection, competition, and are coordinated or carried out by the most powerful individuals. So they're not you know, necessarily co um, committed by people who have a personal issue and kill someone, but it's more in the context of business, gangs, drugs, um, this kind of thing. And then the victims and offenders are mainly young males. They use weapons and they're often from the private community. So the picture is a bit different here. Now, what can work is early intervention. The police um, should focus on certain individuals and groups. So that's the focus deterrence we talked about to reduce drug demand through treatment, um, ingraining nonviolent norms in people from a young age, you know, so going into schools and you know, putting support around them, doing some education. And they need to understand gangs better. We need to understand the markets, markets better. And we need to um, understand the interactions between gangs and markets. So what the um, next phase for Nick Morgan's research is going to be from the Home Office is they want to find out, you know, what's working well in other places. So, for example, Japan, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk about this again. There's a low homicide rate there. Most victims are female. So that's very different from what we've been seeing here. Homicide rates in Brazil are 20 times higher than here in the UK, and over 90% of victims are male. Completely different picture from Japan, for example. So in Brazil, more than half of victims are between 15 and 29, very young. But in Japan, almost half are over 60. So in Japan, the people that get killed tend to be older ladies. And Japan has very little homicide between young men. So, you know, what, what is going on there? Um, so Nick's research will now look at these international factors and find out, you know, what, what causes the different patterns, the different behaviors, and what could perhaps we take from these other countries to see if we can implement something here. As I mentioned, the, the full report is on the government website. I think I just went to um, gov.uk 
put in Nick Morgan homicide trends and patterns and could find it. And he's happy for people to email him with questions. And this is his email address here. And that was the summary of his talk. And uh, I hope you found that interesting. And if you do, then please do watch his version of it. Obviously, he was the one who carried out the research. He was the expert. And he might explain things a little bit differently and in more detail. And I hope you will find it useful. Thank you. Bye.